I'm Kim Montalip in Ohio. I am a casting director and a member of the CSA. And um, we are joined by writer Kenneth Lynn. Hello, Ken. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. So Ken, is it okay if I call you Ken? I've been sure. calling you Ken. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, something that has come up, I think, um, in other conversations about casting and particularly in light of the AAPI community and representation is this idea, obviously, that there aren't a lot of us in this industry or in this entertainment space and even fewer in the writing space. And so I'm so curious, what got you into writing in the first place? Um, well, you know, like when you first sent me the list of questions, I think you had phrased it as, um, you know, why wouldn't you, why did you choose a career path that wasn't more lucrative, right? Right. Oh, well, I, I think what I said was in light of what our elders tend to encourage us to do, right? right. Which is not pursue a creative career, but right. pursue something more stable. Um, but you chose writing. So I'm, I'm, I'd love to know why. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I just also wanted to speak because I, I end up speaking to a lot of um, parents because <laughs> people come to me and say, well, you speak to my parents about it. And um, so I thought that was an interesting question because it's one that comes my way a lot. And, you know, just in terms of like a lucrative career, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, what a television producer is is making, you know, it's not really, you know, um, less than what you know, the top doctors and lawyers um, in the country are making. So in terms of a lucrative career, um, it is not strictly a path to penury, right? I mean, um, the economics of it all become much different in the theater as compared to film and television. Um, but for my personal journey, like I love the theater and I always consider myself a theater artist first and foremost, but as a child of immigrant parents and a person who uh, whose family was just establishing their roots in America, uh, who didn't have a safety net. I always knew that um, film and television was going to have to be a part of my journey. You can have a family and and you can have the things in life that are outside of the work. Um, it is possible um, and it is a completely viable uh, career path uh, for somebody as viable as anything else. And I, I really make it a point to say that um, to, to the families that I talk to. Um, and I think that for me, yeah, like I certainly had a lot of people telling me that I shouldn't go into this field, that, that it was too tenuous. And I just knew that I wouldn't be able to, you know, like at the end of my life, I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror um, and say, there's something else that I really wanted to pursue in my life, but I let other people convince me that I couldn't do it. And there was a whole other life that I was supposed to have lived that I never lived because um, I listened to those voices. Um, and, you know, and I guess, you know, there's a, there's a temptation to consider it a sort of a more rational um, way to organize your life in terms of like, oh, what are the opportunities out there? What can I pursue? But like, that's pretty irrational. Right? None of us has a crystal ball. None of us can pre predict the future. Um, the only thing you can predict is what you do with your life, um, what you put into the craft, the, the craft of your choosing, um, and how you treat others. Um, and and um, that's all you can control. How do you start to think about the characters in the plays and the shows that and the stories that you are writing mm -hmm. how do you how do you begin to imagine them yeah well you know like i always say that like actors and writers are kind of the same um species um i i think that some of some of the best writers i know are actors um and because i think the um the process is the same in a lot of ways. It's about knowing what the whole story is and deciding what to show. So in terms of like how to craft character, you know, in some ways I begin thinking a lot about backstory and things like that, or at least I did when I was a younger writer. 
Um, I really honed in and I really had a, like I would write biographies for all the characters and things like that. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, in terms of the craft of being a, a dramatist, all you can show is behavior, right? Um, and and um, so then I, I started to become more focused on like what behaviors I think the characters would exhibit when presented with certain parameters. Um, and and then it, it, it became a, a matter of like creating characters that win every scene. Like one of the best things that I ever did was an observant acting class when I was at Yale. Um, and the instructor kept on saying, win the scene. Both sides need to win the scene. So what I'm looking for in an actor is an actor who's gonna say, this is my scene and I'm going to win it. Everything that I'm doing is, is about winning the scene. Um, so I, that's a little bit of a roundabout answer, but in terms of like, you know, creating characters, like, yeah, I, like I'm looking for characters that are going to behave in a certain way, um, you know, in my scenes, yeah. How much agency do you have when you're in the room to say to maybe the producer, the director, that's what I want, or that's who I imagined, or it sounds like you didn't imagine necessarily, but mm -hmm. but that person clicked with me. Like how, how much uh, agency do you have to say those things? I mean, as a playwright, you have complete agency, right? You know, the buck sort of stops with you as a playwright. And I, I encourage every writer to really exercise that power because um, th there's definitely been times that, I, that it's sort of like the hours late and we need to get somebody, oh, this person that we had before dropped out and now we're gonna bring this person and hey, it's a show and you know, and that's a little bit short-sighted. Um, I do think that so much of, um, so much of whether or not a project succeeds or fails is in casting. If the chemistry there isn't there, the chemistry isn't there. So you really have to hang in there for somebody who is really, really able to create the chemistry that you're looking for. When you're talking about chemistry though, what does that look like? Um, that looks like you're watching the scene with your stomach now instead of your Ooh. head, right? That like you're digesting what's being created. You're not saying, is this food? <laughs> <laughs> is this edible? Was this garnish or am I, was this part of the meal, right? Like when you're seeing that actor doing that role, you are, you are experiencing it as opposed to saying, okay, well that kind of works. And if we do X, Y, and Z, you know, maybe we'll get it there, right? Um, I love that analogy. I've never heard anyone quite put it that way before, but I know exactly what you mean mm -hmm. um, when you're when you're watching with your with your gut, basically, right? right? It's that that right. feeling when it's not it's no longer a cerebral experience. There's something else happening. Yeah, and you're being nourished. You know, you're being nourished, and what you're taking in is complete, as opposed to like this is really just sauce. What other qualities do you like to see, especially say, you know, in an, in an audition scenario, what, what are things that you're looking for? So often you end up seeing tapes or people come in and they don't believe they're going to get the role. They're like, I'm supposed to do this. Right. Um, but, but I already know that I'm not going to get it. So I'm not going to work too hard in making sure that, uh, the sound is correct. You know, I'm going to mess up on this line and I'm just, I'm not going to do the takeover again. I'm just going to go with it. Um, you know, so I feel like a lot of, and, and I understand it also because there's so much rejection, right? You know, like, like, like I'm learning how to surf right now, right? <laughs> and so much of it now, I'm like, like recently I was like, wait a minute, you didn't believe you were going to catch that wave at all, right? You paddled into it because you were supposed to when you saw it coming but in your head, you knew you were gonna fall off. So that was the whole thing. And, you know, lately I'm like, no, 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 you have to believe you're gonna stand up on every single one of these. Um, so I'm looking for somebody who, who really believes they're gonna stand up um, on the role. There's also sort of um, this notion of like, is, is the performance you're seeing something that honors itself, right? As opposed to, 
like, oh, am I going to try to get this job? But like, am I like thinking about what this scene is? And um, am I putting my best version of it out there? Come hell or high water, right? Um, you know, because there's that sort of density of intention. And so for, for a creative like me that's looking to have ingredients for a recipe, um, it like that's what I want to see, like somebody who brings their craft to it and says, this is my interpretation of the scene. Um, and I care enough to prepare for it, right? This is how much I cared about it. I made it something my own. Um, and I'll remember those actors, even if they're not quite right for the role. Because, you know, and a lot of times, like an actor will just simply not be right for the role. And that's fine, right? And I think that like not getting a role um, because you're not quite right for it is not something to be ashamed of, um, but like, you know, making that role your own, it's, you know, it's always memorable when an actor does that. And, you know, and when you watch a lot of tape, the, like the ones that do that, that, you know, that put the preparation work in really, really stand out, really stand out. It's, it's, it's like, it's like a light goes on. Yeah, I totally agree. And also I like to think of it as actors, should be laying the groundwork for the relationships that they have with casting directors and so they should try to do well for everything because even if they're not right for a role they could be right for a role six months from now or a year from now mm -hmm. um and and i wonder actually ken if there's a a part of you sometimes when you're writing if you ever think of well I know I know maybe this doesn't quite work because of the analogy you gave but like do you ever think oh you know that person could totally play this role if you know if they're available or you know what I mean like when you're when you're creating a character do you ever remember really good people who came to audition for you um I mean it's harder to want to create a character for somebody that you've only met on tape and because of coronavirus, like I really haven't, you know, and I just moved out here, here to LA. So I haven't had the opportunity of like seeing somebody and being like, hey, let's talk and just know each other, right? But certainly in my life in the theater, um, having, you know, been a part of lots of theater workshops and lots of productions, um, like I definitely meet actors that I write for. Um, this play that I've, I, I'm writing right now for Arena Stage um, Exclusion about the Chinese Exclusion Act. I've written for, I wrote for a specific actor, right? So I definitely, you know, I'll definitely do that. Uh, I've definitely created roles um, in hopes that certain actors that I've worked with um, will be able to, to play. So yeah, there's definitely that. As an AAPI writer, you work on things that are not exclusively AAPI. Um, you create plays that represent worlds that aren't necessarily the worlds of, you know, around you or of your community. And, and there's a certain liberation to that and, and freedom to that, that I really hope that we can all aspire to, because I think that's what we want as artists is to be able to roam freely in this universe of possibility and storytelling. Um, but that brings me to this idea that has, you know, been talked about quite a bit lately, uh, especially for Asian storytelling, which is the, the idea of authenticity. And I know you and I have talked about this before, and I'm curious how you, what value do you place on that idea of authenticity, and particularly when it comes to casting the plays and stories and shows that you work on? Authenticity means like, if the character is Chinese, then a Chinese actor should play it. Yes. Um, and, and like a Korean actor or a Japanese actor or a Southeast, uh, or a Southeast, uh, any other Southeast Asian actor shouldn't play it. Is that, is that what you're saying? That is, that is, yes. Broadly speaking, that is the definition that I am working with. Okay, so that's obviously tricky and very controversial and I don't know, I don't know if I have like very sophisticated thoughts about it um, and I'm very open to hearing other people's thoughts. So like whatever I say right now is from, you know, is from a person who's hasn't thought about it 
in th in this context that much. So this is a kind of you know a little bit of an off the cuff analysis, um, but from a person that is saying, please, if I need to be educated more, educate me more, right? So that's where you know that's that that that's where I'm coming from. Um, you know, so for the first part of your question, like how I've been able to write so broadly. Um, yeah, right, because I write, you know, I do Star Trek, which is space. I did Warrior, which is action. I did House of Cards, which is like prestige political potboiler and um, Clarice, which is sort of horror suspense crime. And that, so that's like film and TV stuff. Oh, and Sweet Bitter, which was like a half hour, like dramedy. And so, yeah, like like I've been I've been across the board. And I for me, I just think good story is good story. Um, and I like, I have a broad range of tastes. So like, yeah, like you're giving me a different set of parameters. You're giving me a different set of ingredients. Um, but good story is good story. Right. And of course there are certain people that, um, are really steeped in horror or are really steeped in sci-fi, um, who can like create a lot of in, uh, provide a lot of insight, um, on like what else is out there you know, and how this particular piece is in conversation with everything else. And that's something that like, I don't necessarily have access to, but um, I think I've been able to create, you know, good value in all of the things that I participate in because I just love a good yarn, um, no matter what, no matter <laughs> what. So that's, I mean, and that's kind of why, how I ended up sort of crafting the film and the um, theater career I crafted it's just I just wrote whatever was really interesting and I guess it was sort of like like my entire decision to to um pursue this life it was like how many chances how many plays am I going to get to write how many chances am I going to get to do this am I going to like feel like I didn't tell the story that I wanted to tell I just couldn't live with that I just you know one I, I noticed that in a lot of the plays that I write I like the people end up in prison and this was something that was completely shocking to me. I didn't, you know, like everybody ends up in a prison at some point or is worried about getting to a prison. I was like, wow, this is like the, like somebody's like, is there a theme? Is there a theme? I'm like, no, there's no theme. Look at my body of work. But if there is a theme, like there is a prison in almost every one of my plays. And that was a shocking thing to me when I, when I first realized it. As minorities here in this country, we get so hemmed in all the time. Uh, and I realized that I fight that all the time. Um, so that, you know, it makes total sense to me now that I'm always writing about a prison of some sort. Uh, so that, you know, sort of leads me to the second part of the question, right? Like um, authenticity, you know, with this definition that we agreed on. And I do think that this conversation is probably a response to the prison that we live in. Um, because the prison forces scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that scarcity in a lot of ways is driving that conversation in a very fair way that I understand. But I certainly wouldn't want to not get to work on all these projects because I'm Asian. Um, and that's not authentic to to, you know, writing about the presidency of the United States, right? Right? Like, imagine, imagine, like, they were hiring writers, a writer's room, and they looked at my play and said, wow, this guy's a good writer, but we're writing about the president of the United States, and no Chinese person has ever been president of the United States before. So we think he's great, but it's not authentic enough, right? So it's like, are we building another prison to deal with the prison that we're in? Um, and so, you know, and there's no clear cut answer to that, right? Like in this, yes, and because there's the scarcity, like I think that it's generally a good policy, right? That if there are two actors that are both doing a great and equal job and one of them happens to be exactly ethnically right for the role, then yeah, like there's nothing wrong with that being some kind of advantage, although like how you even judge equal or not equal and quantify that is also something you can't even really do right so. Um, so you know I, I really honor and respect and think you know and in my casting choices do consider all these things and my and my collaborators really 
really think about all these things too. Um, one thing that I would be concerned about is like, are we sort of like limiting our opportunities by holding ourselves to a standard that Caucasian actors have never ever had to be held to, right? Are all the Caucasian actors who have played Irish or French or British or what or Dutch or whatever are they uh, of those lineages? I, I you know I don't think that's a standard that that Caucasian actors are holding themselves to, and and Caucasian storytellers are holding themselves to. Um, like you know, so I don't know how um helpful it necessarily is for us to hold ourselves to those standards um but it's also like a really hard difficult complex subject matter that we all need to be thinking about um and creating more space for each other um and and i think and ultimately i, I think the only way for us to maybe get out of that prison is to just be creating more content so that you know there isn't that scarcity because like that seems to be the problem that we need to be addressing so if you look at what i'm working on right now like i do try to focus on projects for asian actors as much as i can now especially when i have a choice like like in the theater um, i am focusing on that because for me i'm trying to create space by eliminating scarcity um and then then I think, it, 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 you know, but, but again, it's a very hard, difficult conversation. And, you know, if, 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 I, if I need to be educated on it, I'm definitely here for it. You know, Ken, I, I will say that I feel like you have educated me, um, even in my practice. No, and I mean this from not just this conversation, but other conversations that we've had. I, too, believe that the authenticity uh, question is incredibly complicated and and so I you know for me as a casting director it has come down to a project specific um, uh, approach sure. in that you know you look at every project and say well what does this story demand what does this story call for um, and then ultimately everything revolves around that. And, and in some ways, obviously, when I say story, it, it, it revolves around the vision of the playwright or the writer, you know? So, so it comes back to folks like you, which is why I think it is so important, as you pointed out, that you are not constrained by this idea of write what you know. I've heard that so much, right? In terms of like artistry, you write what you know, you write which maybe to some extent, you know, like, obviously that's true. <laughs> You're writing what you know, but it seems to me from what I'm hearing you say is that you've chosen also to write about what you don't know. For me, that's the great joy of being a writer. That's the best, like, I think of every new thing that I'm doing as like an inoculation, um, you know? And like the, the beauty of being a writer is to, and probably every kind of artist, I can only speak about writing, but um, the beauty of being an artist is to choose how you grow, um, which means that you, you have to do a lot of work on yourself as an artist. Um, and you have to say, hey, I need to grow a lot there. Let me go you know, scare the hell, of my, hell out of myself and go write about that. Because for everything you work on, at least for me, like, like I grow in terms of, you know, my basic historical knowledge or technical knowledge about something. Um, but, but also like the parts of myself that continually strive to evolve. So, I mean, I don't exactly even know what it means to write what you know, because I don't even know what I know, right? <laughs> like, like we don't know ourselves in the moment. Yeah. Like I make this analogy a lot. It's like, you look at yourself, like somebody takes a picture of you right now and you're like, oh my God, my hair, I need a new haircut. Or like, I need to lose weight. Or, you know, like, why am I wearing that, you know, floral shirt, you know, <laughs> like, but then like five years later, you look, look at that picture and you're like, hey, I look pretty good back then. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we don't, we don't know who we know, uh, who we are. We don't know who we are in the moment and we don't know what we know to write about. Um, but we can know what we yearn for, right? What we want, what we're afraid of, what we're ashamed of. Um, 
and we can go we can sort of like launch ourselves in that direction so i don't know like yeah write what you know like in the end like i'm always writing about a prison <laughs> but have you been right? to prison so you know I, and i have not been to prison um so you know in the end like i'm always i am always writing about that but like i guess i'm like in my work i'm always trying to escape that prison um and that what what that's what creates the tension that is what allows me to wake up and want to do it again the next day um that's what allows me to like still look at the world in wonder and to cherish it and the people in it you know so that's and that's and for me it's all about like like what's the life i want to live and who do i want to be in it and and uh that's why like being an artist has become a life choice i i'm just so encouraged really that um that you are sort of in the the writing trenches creating mm -hmm. these worlds that are popping up on theaters and stages and tv screens and because to me it kind of boils down to this idea and I, you know now that, now that we've had this conversation i almost feel like this word does not really capture what i'm getting at which is representation mm -hmm. it feels so flat this word because it feels like you know, you could parade a few uh, Asian faces on a stage or on a screen and somehow that checks a box. And we all know that that's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. That there is, you know, just the complexity of our humanity is often not seen um, in, these, in these stories that are shared to a wider audience. But someone like you, obviously, I feel like you you think about these things, and so all your characters are crafted with that nuance and with that attention to humanity. But what else are you hoping for in mm -hmm. terms of representation for the AAPI community, you know, all over uh, the entertainment industry, not just not just, on stage or you know on screens but behind the scenes and in the writing rooms like what are you hoping for right well you know i think like the first thing i want to say is like and i'm so grateful for the aapi artists the actors that are slugging it out um i know it's not easy right like 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 so we're all in the trench together and <laughs> i really like i love actors so much uh i really think that actors are just the most extraordinary artists and the most extraordinary people I know. And um, for the actors that are out there doing it, even though there is this scarcity, right, that are like becoming great artists, um, like, I love you guys. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and, and I'm, uh, I'm, you know, uh, grateful in the other direction. And what I'm hoping to see, you know, I think that like, you know, there's an interesting talk about like representation in terms of you know, like, like representation in terms of volume is very, very important, right? And we simply need more volume, pure and simple, however it comes. Um, so, so there's that, right? And one area, one aspect of representation that I think maybe isn't discussed enough is sort of lens and perspective, right? Because like, I feel like we're doing a lot better on the volume front. Um, and I think it's time to begin to have like a slightly different conversation about like how Asians are portrayed as well, right? And that comes to lens and that comes to the angle which which a lot of the pro projects are, are, are approached. And, you know, I think, what we're really what i'm really hoping for in terms of the next evolution of you know where we are in terms of creating stories for and uh, stories about asian people is that we're really creating stories for asian people as well right as opposed to like we are writing about asians for a different kind of consumption um and i think you know for me that's a, that that boils down to a lot of like are we creating projects that look at Asian people from the inside out or the outside in. Um, and so, you know, right now, like I, you know, just by the nature of, of the world, like 
like we're saying, there's not that many opportunities right now, or there haven't been that many opportunities for um, Asian artists. So in a collaborative field, a lot of my collaborators end up not being Asian because that's where the talent is and that's where the opportunities are. So, you know, I work with all these wonderful, well-intentioned, brilliant, talented, good-hearted um, collaborators who aren't necessarily Asian. Right. And I don't think it can be helped that even if even if we're writing about even if we're creating something about Asian, it can't be helped that like there's an outside in perspective. Right. Because that's what's just true. Right. And that ends up being a part of the work. Right. Of like 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 any any artist would have this kind of dilemma. Right. I'm writing about I'm creating something that's not of my culture. So my struggle with creating something that's not of my culture becomes kind of um, baked into the project somehow, right? Um, and there's no, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Like that is a reasonable artistic process. But I do believe that the more we find Asians behind the camera, the more we're the more we're going to be able to start telling stories that are from an inside out perspective um, and for our consumption. Um, if that, you know, you know, and, and like not not to take anything away from any of the collaborators that I work with, because, you know, on the whole, I've worked with really wonderful, well intentioned people that are trying to change the conversation and trying to move the ball forward. And I've been successful in doing that. And I really like honor and respect and I'm grateful for that. Um, but eventually, but the next wave, right, is, is, uh, is going to be Asian stories from an inside out lens. And I think that, and, and I think there's room for, for, for all of it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, Ken, this has truly, truly been such a pleasure to oh, talk to too. you and to hear your perspective. Um, I'm just glad you're you're out there working. <laughs> <laughs> may, may I continue to be? 